everyone. My name is Mindy Osborne and I'm a high school counselor at Fuqua School in Farmville, Virginia. I'm thrilled to be here today with the Virginia Children's Book Festival and we will be talking to Laura Lee Gulledge, the author and illustrator of the graphic novel The Dark Matter of Mona Starr, which was released in April of this year through Abrams Book. Uh, Laura Lee holds a master's in art education from James, from James Madison University and has an impressive resume of teaching experience. She currently teaches through the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, the Freyland Museum of Art, and the Virginia Commission of the Arts. Laura Lee's debut YA graphic novel, Page by Page, was nominated for the prestigious Eisner and Harvey Awards. Her second graphic novel, Will and Wit, has been adapted into an innovative multidisciplinary musical with her team of art nurses. To learn more about Laura Lee Gulledge, her mental health inspired graphic novels, Artner Love, and really all things Laura Lee, please go to whoislauralee.com. You won't be disappointed. And now I'll turn it over to Laura Lee Gulledge, author and illustrator of the graphic novel, The Dark Matter of Mona Starr. Welcome and thank you for being here, Laura Lee. Oh, it is so wonderful to be here. Hi, Mindy. Thank you all for tuning in and thank you for having me on this video live stream. Uh, I am here in Charlottesville, Virginia, also mo known as Monacan Occupied Territory. And today in this one hour program, I'm going to be talking to you guys about my new graphic novel, The Dark Matter, Mona Star, and how she models how I deal with mental health. Because like all good writers, I write what I know. So, and I'm not good at making up things. So I'm gonna share some of the things that have helped me deal with my mental health because I don't know about you guys, but I am feeling all the feels right now and things are really intense. So hopefully some things that I've figured out can maybe help you on your journey or at least maybe help start a conversation. So at the end, we'll have time for questions. And let's see. Okay, I'm going to throw out a lot of ideas in the next 60 minutes. So if you want to get a piece of paper, maybe write some stuff down or sketch, take sketch notes, uh, I invite you to uh, join us. And okay, let's get started. Um, I guess, let's see, first I'm going to talk a little bit just about me and Mona, and then I'll walk through the 10 different things that really help me out. So I guess a little bit about me, well, I'm, I might come across as very, you know, I don't know, confident or extroverted uh, speaking to you on this video, but just for context, I have to point out that I'm a very well-trained introvert. So I'm going to do a little screen share for um, a bunch of the talk now because I want to, uh, I feel like pictures are better um, to a company. So to put myself in context, this was me. I know she's a super cool kid, right? So I was a shy, weirdo, introverted artist. Um, and I always loved to draw, but I never really thought I would do it as a job because I was very practical. Um, and so I would just work in sketchbooks and make art for myself. I went in just to school to become an art teacher. And it was when I was a teacher that I really turned to sketchbooks to help me draw about all the different things I was feeling because I don't like to, you know, talk to people about how I'm feeling if I'm having trouble because then I feel like I'm bugging them or I feel like I'm confused so I don't know how to talk about how I'm feeling. So I decided, wait a minute, I can draw. So this is a resource I have to use. Otherwise it would just be foolish not to use it. So I started working in a sketchbook and I started to use myself more and more as a character to draw about how I was feeling. And I would write little captions on the side. Um, and this format, which really now is Instagram, you know, 20 years ago, no one was really interested in this type of artwork. So when I left teaching to figure out, you know, myself as an artist, I got really frustrated because my art didn't fit in anywhere. So here you see when I would do art shows, I would just put all my drawings up on the wall and the styles are all over the place and people just didn't know what to do with my stuff. So I moved to New York, which is what you do when you're not sure where you fit in at home in your small town. And that's where I was first handed graphic novels. And miraculously, without any training in comics or illustration or graphic novels, I managed to uh, break into publishing because, um, I don't know, it was a format that I had never thought about working in before. So when I decided to write a book my own way, I thought, well, I'm just going to write what it's like to be an introvert, where a lot of the time we are in our head. 
So not all the interesting stuff is happening on the outside, like with extroverts who like to put everything more on display. Introverts, we sort of will hide it more behind closed doors. And maybe if we really get to know you, then we'll reveal our real self to you. So when I discovered graphic novels, I was like, this is perfect. I can draw my inner world on the outside. So I work in a style I feel like many would call magical realism because it's set in reality, but I will draw things that are invisible to express what my character is feeling. So in page by page, it's through her artwork. She sort of is in her drawing world versus the real world. And Will and Wit, her Will's shadows are alive and sort of taking shape of things that she's having trouble dealing with. Um, and uh, oh, I've also done an interactive sketchbook, which is not a graphic novel, but I'll talk a little, touch on a little bit in this talk because I got my start in sketchbooks. Sketch page works in a sketchbook. Let's just say I'm obsessed with sketchbooks. Um, but what we're really going to talk about today is my latest book, which is The Dark Matter Mona Star. Um, and I'm so excited to share this work because it's probably the work that I put my heart and soul in the most and made as the most personal and vulnerable as possible. Because I've learned as a storyteller, people don't want what's cool from me. They want the most awkward, embarrassing, vulnerable stuff. The stuff that you don't want to talk about, yeah, that's what people want to know. So I wanted to give myself, so I wrote myself a really challenging script for Mona, not worrying about how I was going to draw her. So then when I went to draw her, it was like, curse you, past tense me, why do I have to draw an entire orchestra? Why do I have to draw all these characters in glasses? Because it's harder to draw characters in glasses. Uh, I wrote a script of what I wanted to read and, and gave myself a challenge so then future me would have to follow through. And actually it worked out. And I think what's really fun about comics to talk about mental health is because anything you talk about in comic form, it makes it a little easier to take. You know, because some of this stuff can be really intense, talking about things like depression and anxiety. And so somehow when it's filtered through a comic book, it makes it taste a little more palatable. Because um, also I think when you speak with pictures, you can speak to somebody differently than when you use words. Because I don't know about you guys, but pictures are my first language. And if you are into other books like mine that talk about health and healing, there's actually a subset of comics called Graphic Medicine, which you can Google. And there's tons of other comics like mine that are being made right now about this stuff. So like Ray Natalka Meyer's Guts is another great example. But anyway, hashtag ask your librarian. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, let's see, mental health. I want to keep doing this here. I'm going to stop the screen share and then come back to it in a second. So Juanita. My stop sharing. I'll go back to me. Okay, I'll go back to it in a sec. Um, okay, so before I talk about Mona stuff, I want to just touch real quickly on what I mean by mental health. And so um, when I was first starting to write this book, um, I was like, okay, we're gonna make a book about depression. Yay, that sounds fun, right? I thought, A, this is gonna be embarrassing, and B, this is gonna be a huge bummer. So I wanted to make this book more about healing than depression because I wanted someone to finish reading it and put it down and be like, oh, I just read a great book about art or love, about healing, about friendship. I didn't want them to say, oh, this is a book about depression. Um, because for me, I feel like that I need some hope at this time. And part of the reason we make art and we tell stories is to uh, give ourselves that hope. So one way I sort of tackled this project to help me out is that I use a different word for depression. I personify depression as the matter. So the matter in the book is sort of this, almost like I pictured like a spilled ink bottle that takes different forms and shapes through the story, sort of interacting with Will and like haunting her sort of like a ghost. Um, and cause I feel like if there aren't words that apply to how you're feeling, then it's our job to come up with new words. Um, and so I guess what I also want to touch on about mental health is that um, for me, um, when I think about this stuff, I sort of, there's three things that happen which lead to me having a mental health issue. The first thing is that I will get overwhelmed because I do want to point out that emotion, e-motion, it's energy in motion, e-motion, which I only learned recently and it sort of blew my mind because when I think about an emotion like that, it's like, okay, I experience an emotion, whoosh, 
it overwhelms me because I'm sensitive and especially if my guard is down. Um, and so the problem is not the emotion because let's say I get depressed. Whoosh, you know, I'm not going to be like, oh, depression is bad because I just never want to feel bad. I must get rid of it. Sometimes it's there because it needs to teach me something. So the emotion itself isn't the enemy to me. It's more of when the emotion gets stuck. Because I feel like that if I get depressed and like, oh, I just, you know, you know, feel like this is really bringing me down and I'm like going to phone a friend and she's going to help me out and then I'm going to climb out of it. But it's when the emotion comes in and I feel and I don't even notice it, it's coming. I don't know what emotion it is. Um, it's confusing. Maybe I just bottle it down. That's when it's a problem. So it's okay to have the sad emotions and the hard emotions. It's okay. It doesn't mean like you're doing something wrong. It's just what do you do when you then have the emotion? How do you get that energy out of you? So to me, the key is to whenever something is overwhelming and comes in, I'm like, ah, instead of just hiding it and pretending everything's okay, is to identify it, what is going on, and find some way to get it out. Even if it's just saying out loud what it is, it's a huge help. Because when it gets stuck in your body, that's when it like makes you sick. Um, so yeah, you just gotta get it out. And if you really are having an issue, um, I, please, I would advise you to talk to your healthcare provider about a plan to help you deal with whatever you're dealing with. Uh, because I'm not a licensed professional, I am an artist. So anything I talk about here today, I'm speaking as my point of view as a HSP, a highly sensitive person, which is a real thing, by the way, <laughs> uh, as an introvert, uh, as a person who talks to their genius all day, which might make me sound crazy, but it's not. Um, and let's see, I'm also, I have obsessive tendencies and I'm a lifelong insomniac. And what else? Do, 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 do. And yeah, just being a general weirdo. So I encourage you guys to find what works for you. So anything I, I share, just take with a grain of salt. Okay, disclaimer aside, let's get into this. <laughs> now I'm gonna go back to the screen share. If Juanita helps me out, screen share. Okay. Are we back into the screen? I think so. Ah, cool. Okay, so how does Mona heal? Oh yeah, here's her matter. Um, everything in the book is super duper gray tone. So the matter with the jet black ink, it like really stands out. Okay, so. The number one thing that helps me deal with my mental health, consider this my prescription uh, for creative practices. The first thing that really helps me is artner love. And artnering is a word that I came up with with my primary artner, Lauren Larkin, uh, because I needed a word to describe this connection that we had because it was more than friendship. Because uh, I feel like when you have a collaborator, either you work together or you're just supportive of each other's individual projects. It's an essential part of my support system because as an artist, a lot of the time you work by yourself if you're drawing. And so that's one reason like Mona playing in the orchestra I love because I played in orchestra because it was great to have a whole orchestra of artners. So then it's, oh, look at what we made together instead of look what I made by myself. And so I wanted to have the love story in Mona actually be an artner love story because Mona is super sad because her best friend Nash just moved away, but then new girl Haley shows up um, and it's just instant artner crush because this has happened to me where I see somebody really shining and doing their passion and it's just so like, Whoo, who is that person? I need to make some art with them, but it be can be confusing when you're young because um, you're like, what are these feelings? But to me as an adult, having this framework and this language, it means that I, I reframe the people in my life like, oh, this person is my partner. Like they're part of my support system. They've got my back. They're here with me in the studio, even if I'm by myself. And it's really helpful to deal with all the more challenging aspects of being a creative. So like here on the left is Mona reading a poem of hers to Haley, which is very like vulnerable, but that's part of what partnership is, is to practice coming out of your shell uh, with someone who's showing you it's a safe space, like it's welcome to come out. And then on the right is our partnership poster, which I stole from Picasso, because steal from the best. 
And so these are sort of the tenets of partnership. So with my partners, these are the five things that we always focus back on and we sort of check in about because uh, these are to counteract all the more negative sides of the creative life. So we have connection to battle isolation, flexibility to counteract our overly high expectations for ourselves, success because a lot of us struggle financially and it's really confusing to like ask for money for your work. Uh, whimsy, because sometimes you forget to have fun while you're focused so much on your goals. And then healing, which this talk is really focused on, because creativity is so healing and it's such a resource that we can use to help heal ourselves. It's pretty amazing. So I partner dare you to activate any partners in your support system that you already have. Okay, so next is make a self-care plan. I am so passionate about making a self-care plan that th this is in the back of the dark matter of Mona Star. So I have my plan that's filled in, which this is the updated one. So the font is getting teeny, teeny, tiny as I keep adding things to it. And then there's a blank one so you can fill out your own. And so this is basically just making lists. What helps me out physically? Like what helps me emotionally? What helps me mentally? And these are things that help you deal with stress, things that help self soothe you. That's hard to say. Self soothe. Um, the things that you know help you out. And then on the right side, I have, you know, um, making note of like what things you can at, like take every day to help you feel better. So like as a vegetarian, like fish oil was helpful for me. Um, and then you have your support system, which are just taking toll of the people who've got your back. Because sometimes you forget that there's a lot of people in your support system. If you include your ancestors, your spirit animals, your biological family, your world family, even historical mentors. So Jim Henson is one of mine. So even if I, you know, I've never met Jim Henson, but sometimes I'll sort of pull on his spirit in my studio. Um, and then, of course, the stress warning signs, which... Um, I normally just pay attention to. And once I see flare up, it's like, oh, shoot. Okay, what can we do from the left side um, of the self-care plan? Just pick something and do it to help you right now. And at the bottom, I have my red flag ritual, which is what I do when I'm really losing control and can't think straight and not making smart decisions and just sort of need to do a reset. Um, and I have a whole talk about making a self-care plan. So if you go to my website, um, in my YouTube videos, it's in there. Okay, so next one, because I'm going to go through these fast. Oh, yeah, the self-care plan used to be much shorter, so that's it on the left. And um, if you're interested in mindfulness, um, the Tree of Contemplative Practices is pretty much almost like a self-care plan because I, the fancy word for this is contemplative practice, which um, these are also things that are restorative and help you um, be present in the moment instead of being in the past or the future. Uh, let's see. Next, talk therapy. So uh, this is the only thing in my list that I feel like would need money. The rest of these things you can access for free pretty much. Um, and so talk therapy, I found it helpful in periods where I've really struggled with like depressive bouts. So I guess it's maybe like, I don't know, five or six times in my life where I've really needed help with somebody to work with for, you know, maybe six months. Um, but sometimes you need to speak, you know, depending on the relationship you have with a, with a therapist, maybe you have the same person for like years. So, and it doesn't have to be a regular therapist. I wanted to draw, I've never seen it uh, in a young adult graphic novel, actually a therapist as a regular character. So I just wanted to make it normal because I know lots of people who go to the therapist, but maybe it, your therapist is your book club or maybe it's your hair stylist. So it, as long as you're talking about, have a safe space to talk about what's going on, that's essential. Then next we got creative expression. Um, of course, because art is a healing practice. So it could be journaling like Mona, who's more of a writer. Um, maybe it's doing poetry, maybe it's doing drawing. So actually she does some collage because collage is really fun when you're like upset. Yeah, tear stuff up. Um, painting here, she's ha Mona's having a marker dance party with Haley on the right because dance really helps me. It's my most recent like favorite creative outlet, which is very new and sort of terrifying at first because I don't have the vocabulary. 
um, as like I do with visual art. So Mona is intimidated by dance, so they just dance with their hands. Uh, but it also could be playing music. Maybe your creative expression is gardening. Maybe it's cooking. It could be it's so many different things. Uh, but just having some outlet is helpful. Then self-study. This one is, uh, I've been doing a lot of this lately because you can't really change your, your problems unless you understand what your problems are. And nobody else can tell you how to operate this machine that is your mind. Only you can really go in there and map it out, especially even for someone else to help you. So for me, that's I have like a spiral notebook and where I'll just like dump all the stuff out of my head and start to journal about different topics and just dive into things with writing. Because I find maybe you're more of a typer, but with handwriting, I don't know, I, think I can unlock stuff from my subconscious when I write it out, something about that physical process. So um, so for Mona, she models this, like even paying attention, like, well, what triggers my matter? What helps me and what hurts me? Um, so I've definitely, a lot of my self-care plan I've come up with because I have paid attention to the things how and how they affect me to notice the things that like always bring me down versus the things that always make me feel better. Because um, once you're aware of it, then you can change those patterns. Um, you can even use an app. Um, I use like the iMood Journal app, but there's lots of apps that you can use too to help you track your mood and to help you understand more of like why you feel the way you do when you do. Um, but it's hard when you're young because you're just watching these things play out. So as you get a little older, um, then you can look back and sort of be more aware of like, oh, this is always happening in that situation. Like, like I'm moving right now. And so I know that moving is hard. So I have built in extra support because I've moved lots of times and I know it's hard. So instead of just having it be hard again, I was like, you know what, this time it's not gonna be hard. Anyway, um, so journaling sort of ties into self-study. Uh, I forgot about journaling until recently and got back into it. But the picture here I have is of Mona spitting out like a ball of word of thoughts. Because I feel like my thoughts look like that until I journal and, and pull it apart. Because normally I have like multiple ideas and thoughts just all tangled up in a ball. And so I can't say it out loud because I don't know what I'm, it's just a big old mess. Um, so journaling helps me detangle it. So at least I can tell what on earth is going on in there. Then number six, narrative therapy. I learned about this just recently because I was doing this project where I was writing words on my arm. So as a, as a person who has a lot of thoughts in their head, I've noticed over the years that some of those thoughts are not true. Some of those thoughts are things that maybe, um, I don't know, maybe a bully said to me, or maybe a, a teacher said to me, or maybe some kid on the bus said to me, uh, but maybe it wasn't actually true. Or maybe it was something that used to be true, but it's not true anymore. So suddenly I realized that, wait a minute, some of my thoughts are wrong. And so I flipped. So once I identified the words like crazy, because I kept saying like, oh, I'm crazy, I'm crazy, I'm crazy. But then I was like, no, I'm not crazy. I'm actually a visionary. It's just the way my imagination and my brain works. It doesn't feel normal compared to other people. So if I don't see other people who think the same way like I do, then I just assume there's something wrong with me. Like I must be insane because I'm the only one who's like over here talking to this rock. Like it's real or something <laughs> like that's weird, Lorely. Um, but just because you don't see yourself reflected in the people around you doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. So journaling and getting to know yourself can help you figure out like who you really are versus who, what's just a lie. So for me, I wrote the, I would flipped, I flipped the script, so to speak. So instead of crazy, I was visionary. It's like, oh, I'm not broken. I'm actually pretty resilient. Um, and that, you know, I'm not doomed, I'm lucky. Because sometimes I'll think like, I'll focus on the negative, I'm like we're doomed. But then I step back, you're like, actually, Lurley, we've been really lucky in our life. Like you're just, you gotta change how you look at the situation. So I wrote those words on my arm for three months. It used to be 13 words, then it was down to six words in Mona. And this past summer I was down to one word worthy. So I'm very proud that 
um, I've been able to change my story and let new words sink into my mind. So I don't think that I'm crazy anymore anyway. Um, oh, and I threw nature therapy in here too, because um, nature, being outside in nature is hugely part of my self-care plan. Uh, it's one reason that living in New York was really hard for my mental health because it was so overstimulating and it was just so much all the time. So being back in Virginia and like being out with the trees, oh, it's just so, it's instantly calming. I'm sure a scientist can tell us about the chemicals in the brain and how it affects us, but let's just say it's awesome. Um, okay, seven. Uh, one of my favorite things to help deal with my mental health is music. Oh my God, I am such an audiophile. I make a new playlist every month or maybe two months if I'm running, if I'm running behind. So having, so listening to new music, having music I'm excited about, making playlists, sharing those playlists, it's part of what makes me excited to be alive. Cause there's like a little record player in me, um, which I draw in the book. And I found that music, if I sort of, if I put a record, if I put prints on, on my record player, then I'm thinking of that Prince track instead of thinking about an obsessive thought, let's say about something bad that happened the day before. And I'm just like reliving it over and over and over and over and over in my head. So music helps me put better stuff on my inner jukebox. Um, and it helps me curate my mood because I used to listen to sad music every night before I went to bed. And it was like, maybe this is not good for my mental health. I mean, it feels nice to listen to the sad Nick Drake right now, but maybe I should do like a, like a listen to a meditation or something else instead. <laughs> it's not so depressing. So it depends on you because sometimes listening to sad music makes you feel better when you're sad. Sometimes it makes you feel worse. Um, so I definitely make a lot of playlists to help curate my mood and also with just lyrics to help me get through because musicians will put in words what I do in pictures. So it's kind of awesome when you're making work for each other. Oh yeah. And I can't even make art in the studio without music either. Oh, and Mona, she's also an orchestra because playing music is also excellent. I sing a lot at home. I don't play the violin anymore, but I make up a lot of songs, especially for my cat. We have a lot of songs. And I put one of my playlists in the back of the book because I do that for every book. Um, so these were a lot of songs that were on my rotation while making the book. But also, if fun fact, if you're when you're flipping through the book, you see this scrolly um, music bars going through. Um, I actually designed it so for if you go through in each one of those you see, you play the next track of the playlist. It's like an actual soundtrack, like it's a movie. I know there were song lyrics. I wanted to put them in the book, but for legal reasons, we decided not to, but it was a brilliant idea. Okay. So eight, the next thing that really helps my mental health is volunteering. This is something that I did a ton of when I was young. And I feel like this is the number one thing that helped me from getting super depressed in high school because I was a Girl Scout and I volunteered for so many different things. So this is like based on me being a congressional aide in DC back in the nineties. Um, I also painted a lot of murals. I taught classes. Oh my gosh. I was, I was even in like a theater troupe about social issues, which I never, it's like a, it's a secret. Um, and this is Mona volunteering at the Haven, which is the day shelter, like two blocks from me. Cause I volunteered at the Haven. And to me, this like service helps because it takes you out of your head and out of your own like little bubble of a world and your, you know, your issues and be like, Oh, here, this is takes you out into the real world with like real people. Cause I also like to be in spaces that were not my high school in high school. <laughs> um, and it really, I don't know, it's nice to like serve a different purpose where it's like really clear, like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do and this is helpful. And I don't know, um, I just find that it was what helped me stop from getting stuck in my own head was to get out into the real world um, and especially just being around other nice people. And so the Kennedy Center calls it being actually a citizen artist when you are an artist who also likes to connect with the broader world around you and with your community um, and find ways to use the arts to actually help build the community. So anyway, so that side of things, it really like the artivist side. Oh yeah, artivism. Um, this is something I really wanted to touch on in Mona. So actually Mona and her, and her artners, 
they do a project where they partner with like the whole school. So I really wanted to show just model stuff that I've done where I use art to bring people together because it's amazing what you can do when you have an idea and other people are, I don't know, you have a little art nerd crush going on. Um, okay, then nine, meditation and yoga. I know what you're thinking, mindfulness, blah. Wait, it's still a computer. Um, yeah, and actually, when I first tried meditation when I was in my early 20s, when I was dealing with a lot of anxiety, and I was like trying to be a runner and it was just a terrible idea. And I actually hated meditation. <laughs> I think it's really hard when you get started because you're like, what's the point of this? Um, but after getting back into it maybe five years ago, now I'm like really like, okay, I'm a, it really helps me because I'll do it every night before I go to sleep for 10 minutes and it really helps with my insomnia. Um, but so I'm not going to tell you that you have to start a meditative practice because I know it's not, you know, it might not click with you at this moment. But what I will point out is the why meditation and yoga is helpful is because really it's just about embodiment because a lot of us are living in our head. A lot of us are not in our body. And so maybe then you have health issues because you're not even feeling like you're not connected with what's going on in your body, which happened to me because I was in my head so much. So things like physical exercise, yoga, meditation, these are things that just reconnect you with your physical body. Because um, I think it's a really big struggle right now, especially when the world doesn't feel like a safe space. You don't want to be in your body. Like, I love escapism too. I'll like binge on, I'm binging on Downton Abbey right now because I'm moving. And so part of me is at Downton Abbey. So that's fine and everything. But then I have to also come back to my body and be like, oh, wait, we haven't had lunch. We need to eat something. But the me in Downton Abbey isn't hungry because that's in my imagination. It's like, no, we're here in reality. We have to like feed ourselves orally. Um, but yes, you can speak with a British accent all day and that's fine. Then the last thing on my list is advocating for yourself, self-advocacy, which is something that I never thought about until I needed to advocate for myself. Um, and this is basically when you there's a problem and maybe you don't know what the problem is, but you have to find help for it. And it can be difficult if it's not a problem that's easy to identify. So for me, I was having a pain in my back, which Mona has on the story. And um, and it kept coming up and doctors would be like, we don't know what's wrong. And like, you're fine. And what's hard, and it's, I don't know, when you feel like something's wrong and someone is telling you that you're fine um, and you wonder if you're crazy, then maybe you start to, to believe them. So it means you, by connecting with your body, like to trust what's going on in there um, and to listen to the signals from your body instead of ignore it and pretend like you're a robot because we're not robots, we're like biological creatures. So if there is something wrong, don't, don't feel like you're annoying somebody to like speak up about it, like do something about it. Like it's okay, your, bo your body's telling you something, you gotta listen. Um, and let's see, do, do, do. Okay. I think that is all of the stuff about Mona that I wanted to specifically talk, walk through. Oh, it was one more thing I wanted to mention with back with the meditation and yoga, like this stuff. You're like that again. Um, something that I always think about with, with the embodiment idea is that if you are dealing with depression, a lot of times you're mentally in the past, and if you're really anxious, you're mentally like in the future because you're trying to plan, but you can't. So being in the present, which is what mindfulness is, is really the best cure for, you know, being stuck in the past or present. Because I never thought of those as being about depression and anxiety before, but really it kind of is. Anyway. Okay. Now, what are you going to draw at home? I'm going to run through these real fast. So my challenge is for you. Number one, draw your matter. So this is a page from uh, Sketchbook Dares, and it's actually on the learning page of my website. So you can print it off for free. So this is a little breakdown of a way to draw out your matter, which I encourage you to use a silhouette for your self-portrait. So you don't focus on like, oh, this must look exactly like me. Like, just do a silhouette. Just draw yourself all like, like, um, like one shape. Um, then focus your attention on illustrating your matter. But maybe it would be reversed here. Actually, I reversed it in the book. Um, 
But oh, and here's like my cousin's drawing of what her matter looks like, which is sort of this like dark presence, like clouding her mind. But maybe your matter looks more like my little Mr. Unworthy. That's how I drew my matter this year. Because I feel like my matter is less scary now. It's more like this little, this little, I don't know, Muppety dude who just whispers unworthy at me because that's the only word that he will tell me anymore. Um, but your matter might also, I also visualize it as sort of little Pac-Man ghosts sometimes, like a whole swarm of them. Sometimes I'll think of my matter like that. Um, or maybe it is, it's shaped like a person, like a ghost. Oh yeah, that's a scene in Mona where like dark thoughts like enter her body and then make her sick because that's normally what happens to me. Um, and on the other side is the matter either sucking her into herself or kicking her out of herself. Cause that's the other way I sort of experience the matter. Um, so yeah, giving form to your matter, what does it look like? Um, so it might mean that you distort your body or it might mean that you're a silhouette. It might mean finding a good visual metaphor. Like maybe it's shaped like an anvil and it's above your head. Um, or maybe it has words like my pieces here, which have thoughts uh, woven into them. So that's my first challenge. It's just to draw what your matter looks like. The second one is to draw how you get out of the well. So this is a metaphor that I really, I use all the time for talking about when I fall into depression. Uh, I say I've fallen down the well. And so in the book, Mona here is down the well and her and Dr. Vega, her therapist, is talking about like, well, what are the things that you can do to help you get out of the well? And a lot of these things would be on your self-care plan, um, things that help you emotionally, physically, mentally, uh, but also who helps you climb out of the well? Who are the rungs of your ladder? So playing with this metaphor, um, artistically, you could do... So you could do like cut paper. So like, you know, I don't know if you can see, I'll just hold up here. So cut paper, like I have balloons here um, with, I've written on with different things that help, or it could be a collage. Like instead of writing out on everything with words, I used a collage like, oh, what helps me feel better in nature? So let's just make collage out of the things that help us feel better. And also you can think about what, what does your well look like? Are you underwater? Are you in a night sky? Are you trapped under a bed? Where are you? <coughs> Pardon me. So that's my second prompt. Ooh, let me grab more. Oh, and back to the well. You can come up with other metaphors too for getting out of the well. Like maybe it's an invention. Maybe it's a pogo stick. Maybe it's um, flying shoes. Maybe it's an eagle or an animal helper. I don't know. So you can play with this metaphor uh, for how you get out of the well. And the last is to try the Laura Lee technique. And the Laura Lee technique is based on how I do art therapy on myself, where first I will journal. So first I will just journal to identify what is going on in there. Because normally it's like, I find that my thoughts come in three. So normally there's like three different things going on in there. So first I gotta separate them by journaling and identify it. And then I will um, look for the imagery within it. So if I'm writing about, um, you know, like one of these pieces here in the picture is like my, my heart is a drum. So um, I was talking about like rhythm is like, oh, a drum. Well, how can we draw this like a drum? Like I'll look for in my journaling, what imagery am I writing about? What does it look like? Because um, I use a lot of metaphors when I think. And if it's about a problem, I will normally challenge myself to spin it to what the solution is. Because sometimes if you make art about a problem, it'll just make it worse. So I will often, I'll start with one idea and then think, well, what, how can I spin this? Like, well, how, like what's the next panel of this sequence? So I'll often draw about something that isn't where I am yet, it's where I wanna be. And so sometimes an artwork will make it seem like that, oh, I have it figured out. And it's actually like, no, I don't figure it, have it figured out, but the art is helping me get there. And then I'll sketch it out. Like you see these blue pencil drawings here. There's like little sketches where I will play with my camera angle. Like, well, should we do this close up? Should we be above? Is it from my point of view or am I drawing myself or my eyes closed or my eyes open? 
So this process for me is just asking myself a lot of questions, almost like a therapist would, to help pull out information. And then I will like sketch it out into a cartoon sketch and then onto like nice paper. But first is journaling, identify what's going on there, find the imagery that you're already writing about, then play around with sketching it um, from different camera angles and then drawing out to a final thing. So that's really how I'll do art therapy on myself. First, I'll just be aware of the emotion and then I will um, expel it and go back. And okay, before we bring in uh, some questions, I'm just gonna share a few final things before, because uh, I didn't want them to get lost at the end. So first of all, uh, if you'd like to order a copy of The Dark Matter of Mona Star or of Sketchbook Dares, oh, you can go to my website, which is whoislaurely.com. And I just put up a really cool learning section where I have lots of handouts. Um, I have mini comics you can print off about self-care, about artnership. Uh, I also have videos there too. So I have like a whole video about making a self-care plan. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. So I invite you to go to the learning section. And then the second thing I wanted to share is that I have a comics class for kids coming up um, next week. It's like next Thursday and then the Tuesday after. But if you go to my blog on my website, that's where I have all the registration info and stuff uh, in case you would like to make a comic with me over the next couple weeks. And the third thing I want to share, which is very exciting news, is that Will and Wit, uh, my second graphic novel, set in Charlottesville, is actually now being made as a virtual musical. I know, who knew the virtual musical sort of thing? Now it's a thing because we live in a ever-changing world. So it's gonna make its debut at the Virginia Theater Association Conference, which is virtual, um, on October 29th. So coming up soon. So if there's any theater folks out there who are interested in licensing the show as a virtual production for your theater troupe, please shoot me an email because this is a thing now. And it's really cool. Uh, and I think that's all the things I just wanted to share at the end. So now we're going to, oh yeah, bring back Mindy. Hello, that was awesome. Thank you so much. I just threw so a lot of stuff tips. out there. Yeah, um, it'll be good if people can like go back and, and uh, and, and listen to this, or they could just get the book <laughs> and read it yeah. and, and all this stuff is right there in it, which is what I thought was so cool about it is that it, um, I think it's encouraging people to learn along the way. And I'm so sorry if y'all can hear <laughs> all this, um, a lawnmower, it's literally right outside my window cutting grass right now. So I do apologize for that noise. Um, but anyway, we were supposed to have a young lady with us, uh, Claire Zayner, who could not make it. But I did have a question from her um, that I mm. thought I would go ahead and start a little question portion out with. Um, and you've, you've already touched on this a lot, but she was asking uh, if the dark matter of Mona Star reflects any of the author's own experience with depression. And as you have described, it does. Was there something in particular that was um that was very uh important to you to include in the book because it was so significant in your life i feel like the thing i really wanted to capture with the story was i guess what was always the hardest thing for me is not was when i could not articulate what was going on when it was that question of what's the matter i don't know and that inability to be able to like identify the word or to express what you're feeling, that's always been the most frustrating thing to me, I guess, growing up. And probably part of the reason that I wanted to make art to understand so I could, so I felt like I, I could express myself. So that's sort of like my own personal, um, I guess, issue is that sometimes it's not the feeling itself that's the worst part it's the inability to connect the dots to like allow somebody else to tell you know to understand what's going on the feeling misunderstood part because mm -hmm. then if you can't express what's going on then you can be like dismissed like i don't know then it's like oh am i not feeling this am i just making it up and then you just go into this like doubt spiral um, right so yeah, so I think that's the thing that was always hardest for me was to even just be able to 
express like what's the matter right right and i think that you know that starts at at a young age right i mean even you know when when little kids you know when they're small a lot of those temper tantrums and stuff just stem from not having the words not being able to express so it just manifests itself in different ways the older we get um so i had a special interest in the end of the book where you share your self-care plan and i just thought it was really um really brave of you and uh vulnerable to to be able to share you know all of those things with you um with us with your audience and just wondering what is the the most important thing to you like you have to do every day no questions asked it's a must do every single day 100 percent of the time there's a bunch of things. I feel like I keep adding things because I really want my entire day to be made up of things that are restorative. Like I want life to be self-care. Um, right, right. Because <laughs> the things that I think about the most, uh, of course, I meditate every night before bed. Um, that one's really woven in there. Uh, having actual days off, which I didn't used to do. It's very important. Having spaces designated like oh this is work time and this is like you're supposed to like you know this is like self-care time like you're right. not and having that in your brain day. like you know like giving yourself permission to not think about work and to not do that like that's that's the key to that right <laughs> yes yeah, a little bit of compartmentalization um because yeah I've, I've always been like a very have a lot of energy so it's like i need a lot of vessels for all the energy. Otherwise, if it's stuck inside me, that's when I'll beat myself up. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, let's see, what else of like every day? I mean, I take like a bunch of vitamins and supplements every day. Um, I have Tulsi tea, like I'm obsessed with my Tulsi tea. I have it every single night. Um, and I'm a really big in hiking. Like I hike a lot of times, like right af after I get out of the studio to literally like separate myself from the studio so then when i come back to the house i'm not like just back in work mode mm -hmm. um and let's see oh i've been making myself cook more real food um like i don't know there's so many things i'm working on yeah and i dance every single sunday i do contemplative dance which has probably been the most helpful thing during pandemic because mm -hmm. Because like writing and drawing, I get ideas in my head and I sort of filter them through my arm. But with dance and like making up songs, uh, which I've also enjoyed doing, it's more just letting stuff like stuff just come right through and I'm not thinking about it. So instead of thinking about how to use this paintbrush, I'm more I'm the paintbrush. And so oh. it's actually been really interesting to explore this whole new language to me. Um, and yeah, it has less of some of the negative side effects that like making a graphic novel can do. Cause like to make a graphic novel, you're like making a movie on paper. Like right. it takes like months where you're like in this, I'm building a world mm -hmm. and I'm like a bridge between reality and this imagined world. And it can get really confusing in the, you know, <laughs> going back right. and forth, back and forth. So some yep. stuff that's more like, like movement based it's act, it's like there's no negative side effects except you got to make sure to like you know not hurt yourself mm -hmm. well and how how does this some of these things that you talked about how would that translate into um a high school or middle school um audience uh kids mm. that are dealing with school and to have all these you know their days so planned out for them and programmed um you know, with, with their routine, they can't, you know, they're, they're not able to just say, okay, I, I need a day off or I can, you know, they have, their life is a little more controlled than ours. Um, how do you think that translates into, into that age group? Oh gosh. Well, I feel like you can't change the, I feel like the life is really structured right now. So you can't change that. So it's making the structure work for you. So if it means like you designate certain time as like self-care time, Mm -hmm. And their self-care plan might be like five things written on a post-it note. What are the five right. things that make me feel better? And it's like, okay, during self-care time, just do like one of those five things. Um, so just creating a, a space for prioritizing that is, I think is like the first step, even if it's just like, 
don't know, a friend of mine who's a nurse, she doesn't have any time to do self care. It's like, well, you have to go to the bathroom, right? So every time you're walking to the bathroom, do some like deep breathing. And when you're peeing, like, I know it's not that long, but you can use that time. So you can use whatever time you have, even if it's just like a really little bit of time just to make it intentional. Cause it's really an act of self-compassion for yourself to be like, you know what, I'm worthy of doing this nice thing for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so even deciding to do that or designating a moment for that is huge. Yeah. Um, but if you're, I feel like if there's a thing with scheduling, I invented a fictional assistant to help me with my schedule. So I have a whole video about it too. That we can find on your website. Assistant, Cause they help organized. So that's basically the hat that I wear when I sort of plan what my life is like. So then I can take that hat off. And then I'm like, talent me, because talent mm-hmm. me doesn't care about schedules. Talent me just like shows up and is like, oh, I'm just gonna be awesome. Yeah. Um, so I'll well, use sort of my imagine. I'll use my different sort of characters to help me. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's great. And I'm I'm actually pretty excited to read your other books now that I've um, now that I've discovered this one, I think it's, I think it's pretty, pretty great. And I'm, I'm anxious to read the other ones too, but, um, I have one more question. Um, and, uh, I don't know who else feels like this out there, but if you don't, uh, view yourself as particularly creative or, um, you really don't have the confidence to even draw a stick figure how would you go about um, taking some of these examples or some of these suggestions that you had for us um, as far as sketching and um, and even drawing a silhouette? Um, how, how would you approach that if you're if the thought of doing it gives you some anxiety? Understandable. I I used to be a middle school art teacher, and I feel like people would always tell me their art teacher horror stories. Like the one teacher who made them decide they never draw ever again. So I know that it's really hard, especially if you're like scared of, I mean, the blank page is terrifying. So I'm not saying you have to like dive in, like you must overcome your fear. Uh, When I don't feel like drawing, I do stuff with words. So I'll make word art um, or, you know, because it's still me, as long as it's making marks on paper, that's all that matters. So it doesn't have to be pictures. It could be like just designs and shapes doesn't have to be something that's trying to be real. So I find the key to taking the fear out is to remove all expectations. Like, well, it doesn't have to be a picture. It doesn't have to be real. It doesn't have to be like, you don't have to show anybody. Mm -hmm. I feel like making work that you don't share, like private work is really important. I didn't share my sketchbooks with anybody for at least like 50 pages when I started working a sketchbook. Cause I knew that if I was thinking about an audience or someone viewing it, which is even worse now and everything is on social media, you just, oh, you just fast forward and think like, well, how are they going to, what are they going to think of this? It doesn't Mm -hmm. allow you actually just make the thing. So Uh just keep it to yourself or destroy it afterwards. Like, I feel like that is huge just to remove that pressure. Just anything you can identify, well, what's putting pressure on me about this? Well, how can I just take that pressure off? And maybe it's not drawing, maybe it's getting a lump of clay Mm -hmm. and just like, playing around. I don't know. It could be a different language if it's not drawing or, or also collage is good. If you want to make like a picture, but you don't want to draw do mm-hmm. collage. Cause then you're just like physically cutting stuff out and it's a different part of the brain that doesn't activate that inner critic as much of like, what's that supposed to be? <laughs> right. Right. No, those are, those are great suggestions. I was jotting some of those down maybe for a future uh, reference Finger paint there. with some temper yeah. paint. Oh, always the best way to like dust off the creative cobwebs because you just feel silly. So Mm -hmm. your inner critic does, it cannot speak to you if you're just having fun with something. Right, right. Plus also when partners come into play, you know. Yes. Something with an artner, if they're really good at something, just saying like, hey, can we do something together? Because if you want to partner, all it really means is that you're admitting you need help with something. So like, hey, can you help me with this? Boom, partnership. <laughs> and I love that you've introduced um, me and probably several others to this, uh, to that term, artner. Um, I, I look forward to exploring your, your website a little bit more, um, checking out all the cool things that you have on there. Um, we are about out of time. So I would like to give one more huge thank you to you, Laura Lee Gulledge, 
um, with the Dark Matter of Mona Starr. Um, I have so enjoyed this time with you today and you sharing with us and kind of letting uh, letting the world into your um, into your brain, into your heart. Um, and into we my room. Yeah, we just <laughs> appreciate yeah, your tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, um, and good luck with that also. But um, I would invite everyone, I hope you've enjoyed today, and I would invite everyone to um, join us tomorrow with Terry Lee Benson um, with the Virginia Children's Book Festival. And we just thank you so much. We appreciate you being here. Bye. <sighs>